KKD here, speaking to you from my shack. I realised recently that I have been involved in our amateur television activities for somewhat over 60 years. I don't know if this is some sort of a record, but I thought it might be a good idea to make a record of some of the things that has happened during that time, and not only to include what I myself have done, but to include as much as I could of the activities of other amateurs with whom I have been in contact. It all started for me when at school, when I swapped an air gun for a crystal set, and my mother bought me a pair of headphones for my eighth birthday present. I still use them regularly. Learning of my interest in wireless, some of my father's employees rummaged in their sheds and attics and found radio components and magazines dating from the 1920s and 30s when the making of wireless sets at home was a popular activity. Using these I set about making all sorts of one and two valve radios with swinging coils, bright emitter valves and the like. One such radio exists today. I then built a small two valve portable which travelled around in the saddlebag of my bicycle. I don't know how legal it was to be riding a bicycle while wearing headphones. I discovered the short waves and made a number of valve receivers using plug-in coils like this with which I listened to local amateurs on 40 and 80 metres. Attention then turned to VHF and a small super regenerative receiver was constructed. This enabled two meter amateur signals to be received and also, highly by chance, it could listen to the local law. In December 1948 I joined the Radio Society of Great Britain and was accorded BRS number 17906. My interest in television was aroused when I was given a copy of Every Boy's Hobby Annual for 1937. This included, amongst many other things, an article about television. It described the work of J.L. Baird. It then went on to describe the activities at Alexandra Palace. And I was really hooked on television. The war was coming to an end. And in the window of our local radio dealer's shop, there was a pre-war television set with the back removed, going round and round on a turntable. And I stood for quite a long time, peering into the back of this, trying to discover what on earth all those various bits could do. I first saw television working on the 6th of June 1946, when I was invited to view the Victory Parade, the first OB carried out by the BBC after the war, from the Mel in London. My luck was really in when I found a pre-war Pi 817, five-inch television set on a scrap dump. I managed to get this receiver to go. I replaced the RF stages which used pre-war inefficient side contact valves with the then ubiquitous Pi 45 meg radar IF strip. Uh, this was the second television receiver in Ely and attracted a considerable amount of interest. Uh, while today's domestic arrangements can hardly be described as state-of-the-art, we have ha come quite a long way since 1948. My career very nearly came to an abrupt and untimely end when installing a heavy band 1H aerial on the chimney of our four-storey house in Ely using a ladder coming straight up from the busy main road. In those days my shack was in the upstairs attic. Becoming interested in transmission, I scrounged a monoscope tube, a comparatively easy tube to operate. With this I was able to generate test cards, which I fed into the video stages of my receiver. About this time there was a serious fire in Cambridge, in which a number of early television cameras were destroyed. I managed to acquire the tube out of one of them. It was an RCA 1850A. The aluminium strap which held the tube in place had melted and run down both sides of the bulb. The deflector coils had burned away and so had the tube base. But by doing some detective work I was able to establish 
the connections inside the base. The bulb seemed intact, so I connected 6.3 volts to the heater tails and the heater lit up. Being thus encouraged, I connected one, some scans and one KV and connected the output of the target to the monoscope amplifier and was rewarded by just seeing a faint image of the mosaic. Then the heater burned out. Obviously the vacuum had been damaged. Hearing of this, Cathodian Limited lent me a production reject photicon tube and I then set about the rather long job of building a camera chain to use it. I was much encouraged by the fact that Ivan Howard, G2DUS, had built a homemade TV camera using a 5527 iconoscope which he had somehow acquired from the United States. To him must go the credit of making the first amateur TV camera in the country. This is a clip from the Cambridge Daily News showing a demonstration that Ivan gave of his camera to the Cambridge University Wireless Club in the Cavendish Laboratory. The person squatting down on the left hand side is Mike Barlow who was then up at Cambridge. In due course the camera was completed and here it is in its earliest form in use at the Ely Sports Day in 1951. The interviewer on the extreme right holding the microphone is again Mike Barlow. The camera worked in conjunction with control equipment which was assembled largely using war surplus components which were at that time abundantly available at very low prices. I joined the BATC and here is my membership certificate signed by Mike Barlow, Honsec, on the 20th of May 1952. About this time there started a long and fruitful cooperation with Ralph Royal, G2WJ, and his son Jeremy, who later went on to be licensed as G3NOX. Ralph was able to give me a great deal of help on the RF side with 70 centimetre transmitters, receivers and aerials, while I was able to assist them in the construction of a Photicon camera, generally similar to my own. Here is a general view of the G2WJ ATV station at Great Canfield, Essex, about that time, with the Photicon camera on the left and the transmitters on the right. And here is the G2WJ stroke T call sign card. I took out an amateur license, G3 KKD stroke T, in 1956 and made my first contact, which was with Ralph G2WJ, on the 16th of March on 434 MHz. The next day I made contact with Ivan G2DUS and that started a regular two way vision QSO over a 34 mile path between our two stations for which we were awarded the RSGB's Courtney Price Trophy. In those days my transmitter ran with the power of 1 watt and had nothing more than a 6J6 in its final. This is a picture of two Photicon cameras together with some vision mixing and test card generating equipment in operation at the RSGB's exhibition at the Wo Royal Hotel Woburn Place. In 1957, a group of BATC members were invited by the BBC to Alexandra Palace to see a demonstration of 405 line NTSC colour. This was being transmitted by the BBC in the evenings after the close down of the public service. At home, I constructed an NTSC to field sequential converter and received the pictures on a 14 inch tube with a 3 foot diameter colour filter wheel. This was driven by an 8th horse motor and um, synchronised by what you could call real flywheel sync. Later on, when the BBC started transmitting PEL colour on BBC2, I acquired an RCA 21 inch metal cone NTSC receiver and converted it to PEL fitting a UHF tuner. This receiver was so large that I had to remove the doors from the house to get the cabinet in. It was the first colour receiver in town and attracted some interest amongst the neighbours. The colour wheel used was similar to this. 
A little while later, Grant Dixon used a wheel like this to produce a field sequential colour camera based on a CPS emitron tube and colour signals were transmitted from G2WJ at Great Canfield Essex to Mike Barlow G3 CVO near Chelmsford. This was I think the first time amateur colour transmissions were made. This rather faded picture is of historical interest in that it shows Grant Dixon with his field sequential colour camera and its associated control equipment. In about 1960 a young gentleman came to see me saying he was interested in ATV. What should he do? I suggested he built a converter and put up an aerial and looked for 70 centimetre pictures. He asked how high should the aerial be and I said the higher the better. This is the 110 foot tower which he constructed himself and erected at his home near Sutton St James in Lincolnshire. Henry went on to be licensed as G3REH and became a very active member in the East Anglian Amateur Television Net. NOX and I were invited by the RSGB to operate an ATV studio at the radio show in Earls Court. Here is my camera taking the picture of Shirley Abicare, a popular singer of the time. You will note that the camera had by this time acquired a viewfinder. Before going to an exhibition in London, as my photicon tube was losing sensitivity, I approached Cathodian to see if they could let me have another one. They did, and said that it was a slightly different version, but don't take any notice of these extra facilities, just connect to Earth and it'll work normally. Well, of course, I had to investigate what these did, and found that it was a PES photicon, photoelectron stabilised tube, which overcame the difficulties associated with high velocity scan tubes, in that it didn't need shading correction, tilt and bend controls, and had a good black level. It worked beautifully. During the exhibition, two gentlemen came to look at the camera and asked what tube it was. I told them it was a photocon, and they said, is it? One gentleman then took his hat off and put it over the lens, commented to the other, it's got a good black level. I didn't know at the time that these two people were the two top engineers of the BBC television service. When I got back to Cambridge, I got a fearful rocket from the technical director. The BBC had been on to him, wanting to know why amateurs were using good PES photocons when the company hadn't been able to supply sufficient quantities that were needed at the BBC studios in Lime Grove. I survived to tell the tale. During the uh, 1960s, we operated in the East Anglian amateur TV net. 405 lines black and white, 70 centimetre amplitude modulation with sound generally on two metres. Although I used a vision and sound combining unit which was published in CQTV which enabled me to transmit sound on 70 centimetres through the same aerial, 3.5 megahertz lower in frequency than the vision carrier. That is of course the 405 line standards. Links ran from G3GDR here in Abbots Langley via G2WJ in Great Camfield, Essex up to G3NOX near Saffron Walden up to myself in Ely and thence up via March where there were three stations G6RGX, G6RIZ and G6SPH up to Henry G3REH in Sutton St James Lincolnshire or over to to Brian G6OAT in Mar and Norfolk. A link also ran down to G2DUS. Other stations joined in occasionally. This is a view of my shack in Ely in those days operating in the East Anglian net. By this time some surplus 3 inch image orthicon cameras had become available and here is 3NOX operating his Pi Mark III image orthicon. This camera worked in conjunction with the control equipment, test signal generators, vision mixing, etc. in Jeremy's shack. I also used a 3 inch image orthicon, mine being a Pi Mark IV, slightly more modern. 
which had image orbiting and a skew turret. By now Vidicon type camera tubes were becoming fairly freely available to amateurs. These enabled them to build cameras which had good sensitivity but were smaller, lighter and much less expensive than those which had re previously been used employing photicons, image orthicons or CPS tubes. A group of young engineers in Cambridge built a Vidicon camera and then used it to assemble a roving eye built into an old London taxi called Matilda. Matilda went to various exhibitions including the BATC stand at the Dagenham Town Show. She was then invited by the BBC to go to Lime Grove Studios to appear in the Panorama programme. This is an off the screen shot taken at home of Richard Dimbleby introducing Panorama via Matilda's camera. In 1968 the French Amateur Television Club organised an international convention at Armentier. Grant Dixon, John Lawrence and I went over to represent the BATC and this is the little memento which we were given by the city of Armentier. In 1970 the club celebrated its 21st birthday by holding an international convention on amateur television of its own at Churchill College in Cambridge. Delegates came from many countries in Europe and from overseas. The successful operation of the East Anglian net led to the reception of pictures from various stations around East Anglia at the Convention Hall. Um, we have um, a number of visits lined up for you, some of them on the air, most of them on the air, and um, some of them via videotape. Well, here we are, and good afternoon to everybody at the British Amateur TV Club Convention. Just a slip that way, that's it, lovely. Now, there's a general view. Hello everyone, this is G6KKD stroke T, otherwise G8ADE, speaking to you on videotape from my station. While the rebuilding of an ATV shack is never really finished, this rebuild took about five years. So, 405 became 625, black and white became colour. I installed a computer to generate colour test cards. While I retained my 70 centimetre capability, the main Activity, as far as ATV was concerned, moved to 23 centimetres and FM. On the communications side, AM became FM and SSB, and I also installed an HF transceiver. Until I retired in 1991, I was employed in television engineering, and it was sometimes a little difficult to know where professional and amateur began and ended. We amateurs have certainly cribbed a lot of circuit ideas from professional equipment, but it has not all been in one way, in that simple circuits developed per force by amateurs have been useful when developing simple and comparatively inexpensive professional equipment, such as this Mark IV industrial television camera channel. This was particularly true of the Cambridge low-cost television installation, which employed simple Vidicon cameras. It was used to establish television broadcasting services in a number of emerging countries and subsequently these cameras have found their way into various ATV shacks. Later in my career I transferred to transmitters and had responsibility for UHF TV transmitters with powers up to 240 kilowatts peak sync. Rather more power than we amateurs are allowed to use. In the 1980s I became associated with the Cambridge Repeater Group the CRG and undertook the rebuilding of their 23 centimetre ATV repeater located at Maddingley. PV is a fairly simple and unsophisticated repeater but it has worked well now for some 20 years. On receive a homemade down converter feeds a Camtech IF board while on transmit the Camtech exciter drives the ubiquitous Mitsubishi brick. Incoming and outgoing signals are combined in a diplexer to feed an Alford slot at the top of the mast. We were not able to get space on the adjacent mast which carries BBC, local radio and other broadcast services. GB3PV, located at Maddingley just west of Cambridge, provides a very good coverage of the city and surrounding districts and is particularly good to the north and northeast 
where across the flat Fenlands, stations as far away as Downham Market and Wisbech can get into the box. At the time of making this DVD, July 2008, the CRG has obtained permission to make digital transmissions from GB3PV and tests are being carried out using temporary equipment while this permanent drive system comprising an AGAF MPEG-2 coder and QPSK modulator is being built. In today's check we have two colour cameras one taking a general view and another behind me looking down onto the control desk. We also have an Amiga computer which produces a variety of test patterns. The outputs from these together with all other incoming and outgoing video lines are routed to a video switching panel. This is a simple device with two preview rows and one cut transmission row. It works in conjunction with a 14 inch picture monitor and a waveform monitor. Adjacent to the video panel is a sound control panel to which all incoming and outgoing audio lines are routed. It has a number of selector switches, two rotary faders and a, and a VU meter. Incoming ATV signals pass through preamplifiers and down converters adjacent to the aerials and are then routed to either of these receivers. And the meter here records the signal strength of the PV repeater. I mean DATV signals pass through a free-to-air set-top box. For VHF and UHF communications a drive unit generates sideband or FM tunable through 28 to 30 megahertz and this is then passed to a, to a series of up converters and power amplifiers. These operate on 50 144 and 432 MHz. All incoming antenna feeders are routed via a patch panel. 2 meters we also have a small TR7500. For HF we use an FT77 which works in conjunction with a homemade aerial tuning unit, VSWR bridge, noise bridge and power supply. World War II BC348, very much modified and modernised, is used for general HF listening. This panel controls the switching of all transmitters and the rotation of the 70 centimetre and 2 metre antennas. It controls the rotation of the 6 metre and 23 centimetre antennas. Looking at the uh, transmitter racks, we have 23 centimetre FM ATV transmitter and a 70 centimetre AM transmitter while at the top of the rack is the DATV equipment consisting of a AGAF MPEG-2 coder and QPSK modulator. This can feed DATV signals into either the 70 centimetre or 23 centimetre transmitters enabling digital transmission on those bands. Quite recently we have constructed a transverter which interfaces between the FT77 HF rig and the 23cm ATV equipment. This permits SSB transmission and reception on the 23cm band and thereby enhances the usefulness of both pieces of equipment. And of course we do have a computer this is used to decode digital modes such as PSK31 and SSTV and to look at the streaming from our local TV repeater and most recently of course to look at the streaming from BATC TV. Well there we are. Those are suggest some of the highlights of some 60 or more years very enjoyable and rewarding involvement in amateur radio and amateur television. So this is G3KKD, Ian, signing off and wishing you all best 73s.